Kyle, love it. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, my commute's pretty easy now because he was a transporter, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think I finally found this on YouTube. Very cool. Wonderful. So this is the kickoff then. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the first Pi Data a Dublin remote meetup. And I have here with me Arjuman Jonas and Niall O'Connor. Welcome. And Kevin O'Brien. How are you, Kevin? Uh, good, good. Thank you. How are you doing? Good. Very good. And how are you, Arjuman? Good. How are you all? Holding on. <laughs> it's still pandemic time, so we're holding on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perfect. So I think then this is the perfect time for the kickoff. So I'm going to start then with you, Arjumand. Um, so quick introduction. Uh, you're a senior, senior lecturer on UCD. No, no, no. Senior postdoc in UCD. Senior postdoc at UCD, uh, University College Dublin. And you're also part of the Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, right? Right. Perfect. Um, Wonderful. So you're going to talk to us today about, so your talk is about is social media analytics around COVID-19, a case study of misinformation. Mm, interesting. Oh, welcome. Thank you for the introduction and for this opportunity. So I'll begin my talk. So, like you already introduced the topic, it's social media analytics around COVID-19, a case study of misinformation. My name is Arjuman Yunus and I'm a postdoc at UCD Senior Postdoc because it's my second postdoc and I work with CONSUS. CONSUS is basically the crop management group and we are working on data-driven agriculture, like how to use data science for greater agricultural production. I was also a recipient of the Google Anita Borg Scholarship in 2013, and currently I'm part of the Women in Machine Learning and Data Science of Dublin chapter, and we'll, we're hoping to have our launch soon, so I'll keep you posted on that if you want to follow me on Twitter or you want to reach me out by email. So yeah, I already got this part over. So basically I'm an academic, and I did my PhD in computer science in 2015, and while I do interact with industry time to time, but academia is my first and last love. And also I call myself a part-time activist for different social causes. So this talk is organized as follows. First, I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 and the after, we all know about it, of course, but you know, just to get things rolling. And then what is social media analytics? For those who don't know about this field, it's a whole research area. And then we'll go into some of the misinformation that is around COVID-19 and the challenges due to social media. And then there's a project I worked on recently, just last month. It was called Infodemic Dynamics and we investigated 5G. When I say we, there was a whole team and I'll tell about the team more as I go on. So we investigated the relationship between 5G and COVID relationship. You know, there's a huge conspiracy around it. So we know that uh, World Health Organization declared coronavirus COVID-19 a pandemic in March. And as a result of that, a lot of countries imposed a lockdown to flatten the curve uh, so that the health systems, the public health systems are not overburdened and we don't see a lot of deaths like happened in Italy and Iran, which was very unfortunate. And uh, it was so terrible to see all those images coming from those countries. So as a result of that, work from home became the new normal. So this is a mem I've used, like don't travel, don't socialize, stay inside, coronavirus lockdown rules. Normal people are very sad, but we programmers, yay, that's fun for us because that's what we like doing. So apart, jokes apart, what I did during this time, I saw something on Twitter being posted by some research groups. It was a net COVID workshop and it was run online by University of Maryland Research Group Computation and Mathematics for Biological Networks. It had four tutorial talks over a period of four weeks and also a group project, which we were supposed to do with other 
participants. So it was for PhD students, research scientists, postdocs, lecturers, like anybody who's into science could join it. And they, they, run, they run it very smoothly. Around 300 to 500 participants from all over the globe took part in it. They attended the tutorial talks. Uh, they were mostly on uh, the type, the net COVID means uh, network epidemiology in time of coronavirus. So it helped with an understanding of, you know, how the models are working, why is the lockdown necessary, why does, is social distancing necessary, how the virus spreads to each other, and different uh, models of epi from epidemiology, which are basic, basically mathematical models, and then also some network models of virus spread, infection. There is something called SIR model, something called SIS model. All these talks were given by very renowned professors of the field and they explained their own papers, their own research. And it was a lovely uh, thing that they organized over a period of four weeks. And uh, so we had to group up with six or seven PhD students, postdocs and other people in the whole workshop to come up with a project of our own. And there's also a best project award and a second best project award worth 2,000 US dollars and 1,000 US dollars. They'll still announce the results hopefully in a week or so. But for me, it was a good chance, you know, we programmers also always want something new. So this was like, uh, there's also a social aspect. And like I said, I work as a part-time activist. So I found that this one can be something very good for me. Uh, so, oh, and another thing, all of this talk, although it's over now, uh, it just ended few week, two weeks ago, but uh, any of you, if you're interested in all of the science and uh, list, uh, going into network epidemiology, you can access the tutorials and the projects that the groups did on this link. It's all for free. You just, you can see everything on their YouTube website. All right. So what is social media analytics? That's my expertise. That's basically my area from PhD. I've done a lot of work on it. That's why, so we all brought to the table within this workshop, this net COVID thing, what we are expert at. So the problem is that this virus is so new and it brings so many different challenges with it that not one expert from one field, like although we are singing that thank you to the doctors and nurses and all, but that's not just it. At the breakdown, there are several people who are working on tackling different problems that are arising. Like, for example, there are people from um, uh, network biology, there are people from mathematics, there are people from uh, medicine, uh, there are people from uh, different areas like physics who are working on different solutions around the virus, like and developing different tests, test kits, antibody testing, or vaccine. These, this is on the medical side, the models of how the disease is going to spread or how we can flatten the curve, what are the predictions, all these is, uh, all this is being done by data scientists, physicians, or uh, what do you call them? Mathematicians. So my area is social media analytics and what it basically means when you derive insights from social media data, chiefly through two types of fields, two, two subfields in the computer science, network analysis and text mining. Text mining has been my uh, focus uh, a lot during my PhD thesis. And a lot of companies are using social media analytics. It, it finds applications in customer review analysis. For example, Amazon, you know, there are thousands and thousands of reviews on products. Amazon mines those reviews to make its customer service better. Not just Amazon, a lot of companies do it for better user experience, better customer experience. Then within it also applied to political outcomes prediction a lot. You can find a lot of research works on election outcome prediction within social media analytics. Then there's public health prediction tasks like some scientists in the US specifically are working on how to detect depression from social media, uh, how to, there's also one work on uh, obesity in Qatar, I think, like how much of the population is obese depending on their social media uh, from mining uh, all of it from social media posts so it's a very interesting field and also urban analytics like uh, what are the crime hotspots in a certain urban area or uh, how can we improve the traffic systems so it ties into smart city stuff so social media is very vital in today's 
uh, world. So it gives uh, birth to a lot of interesting applications as well. And that's why a lot of researchers are working on mining it. Mining as in text mining and also mining of the networks on it. But like everything, when there is a pros, there's a cons. And with social media, the problem is that every user can produce their own content. So this has given birth to something we call fake news. And there's a lot of that going around COVID especially. It's because everyone is a journalist. There's a widespread dissemination of misleading information, not just COVID, even before COVID, there, you may have heard a lot of rumors around stuff. And just during the COVID days, there was a rumor about uh, North Korea president that he has died. And for five days, the rumor kept spreading around. Even my brother WhatsApp it to me I kept telling him no it's a fake news but he said no no it's not fake so you get these sort of people who are you know spreading around fake news all the time on Twitter Facebook WhatsApp different social media social media channels so this is another recent challenge that researchers have begun to address since 2013 and that is how to separate the truth from lies over social media if someone is interested, I can send you a lot of papers, a lot of data sets on these. Now with COVID, mm, roughly one third of social media users have reported in the US that they have seen false or misleading information about the virus. And not just United States, uh, it's also true about South Korea, China, my own country, Pakistan. There's a lot of fake news going around and some other countries as well. So the chief, you know, conspiracies or fake stuff that's coming around is that it's an engineered virus. You may have heard of that. You may have had your own doubts after seeing all the fake news because, you know, it sort of grabs your mind when you see a lot of it. So a lot of people are saying that the virus is man-made and it was in engineered in either in USA or in China. There are conflicting narratives about that. Then some people said it's a population control scheme because they want our old population to die because we know that this virus uh, is very bad for those. The vulnerable groups are the elderly, like above 60, above 70. So they want to get rid of the old people. I heard that theory. And the, there, are, there are also many tweets about that. Then there's a 5G thing. We also read about 5G towers being burned in UK and USA. And then the anti-vaxxers, they're everywhere. So even before COVID, they existed. And after COVID, they're like, oh, this virus is being created to spread uh, vaccination programs worldwide. You know, why is Bill Gates so active? Why does he want the vaccination program? They want us to, for to force ourselves into vaccines and stuff. So yeah, that's what that's all. And all of this is has serious consequences. It's not just about you know, just a rumor or a conspiracy theory or like, for example, in the 5G case, we saw some real damage to public property. And so misinformation is in itself may seem harmless, but it leads people to do very, very dangerous things. And that's why tackling it is really important. So now I'll talk about the project that we did within this COVID workshop and yeah, these are my teammates, uh, Amy Knopf, Sam Rosenblatt, Ravi Sharma, Sara Sugars, Ji Song. Uh, of these, all of these were PhD students, except for Sarah. She just, you know, did her defense during the workshop and Amy is a lecturer and myself, I'm a postdoc. So, you know, it's a bunch of geniuses that came up with this. So the idea was GAs. She's originally from South Korea, uh, but she's doing a PhD in the US in Florida. So we've heard about 5G narratives even before the virus. As early as 2016, people have been talking about it and there have been conspiracy theories that it's dangerous, it can cause cancer, it's a national security concern, it's big government, they're trying to make the uh, new world order, it's about deep state, it's something like that. So these are all the narratives around 5G that you can see in this graph, even before COVID. However, COVID made, it was just like a fringe theory. Not many people were paying attention to all the 5G theories. However, after COVID-19, we saw a huge spike 
in all of those conspiracy theories and even celebrities and public figures were buying into it and, and you know, retweeting about it. And so it became mainstream, the 5G one especially. Like, as you can see in the New York Times, there was a heading in April, uh, how a 5G coronavirus conspiracy theory fueled arson and harassment in Britain. And there were cell tower attacks. There were different types of attacks. So this was something that was a very interesting project. And what we did, we used social media analytics to study how COVID affected the 5G conspiracy theories. Did it have any relation? We did some quantitative analysis of it and measured it and which I will show the results. So rumors and conspiracy theories have spread across social media with impacts, with great impacts. Like I said, it's a very dangerous thing. It's not just something that, you know, you read once in a while and you don't pay any like a joke or something no it has serious consequences for public health like the more there's a relationship between those who believe in conspiracies and those to, who don't follow social distancing those who don't follow the protocols of the lockdown and therefore therefore they contribute to spread of the virus more and more so it's like you know something that that goes round and round so that's why it has to be tackled and just recently facebook has announced that from now on any post that it will deem as fake or spreading misinformation about COVID, it will um, take it down and it is taking it down. But this problem in itself remains very challenging because the bots or the people who want to spread these theories have very smart ways to sp spread it. So we collected tweets uh, using Decahose and our sample had 10% of tweets and we searched for the term 5G within the tweets. So we sometimes 5g can occur in a url so we filter out those only 5g <clears throat> without any uh, preceding string or uh, succeeding string we collected those from between january and april 15 2020 and so we had a collection of around 530,000 tweets with this many users and, and uh, earlier our plan was to do multi analysis on multilingual but then we figured out like this graph shows that most of the tweets that had a language tag were in English, so we restricted ourselves to English. Mm, the technique we used was word embedding, like I said in my abstract. The, okay, what is a word embedding? It's something, a very popular technique in natural language processing, which grew in fame around five to eight years ago after the paper by Google on word to vec you can access that paper. It's a very famous paper and you can find many talks around it. So basically what it is, it's just a feature learning technique in NLP in text mining where a word is mapped to a vector of real numbers, a huge vector. It can be like 300 dimensional vector or even a thousand dimensional vector. So it gives a lot of features for every word and it makes our representation of text very, very rich. And it has see it has taken NLP to remarkable heights. Uh, the accuracies that we could achieve in uh, various NLP tasks like test classification, sentiment analysis, and stuff, uh, the the accuracies have skyrocketed due to word embedding. So it's a very neat and cool technique, and very easy to implement. So for this technique, what happens is I'm not going into the technical details. It's based on deep learning. So there are Python libraries to implement it. Uh, there's something called GenSim in Python. If you're a Python user, of course you are, that's why you're here. So if you see the GenSim word to vec or word embedding library, you can easily figure out there are a lot of tutorials of the, over the internet. If you need help, you can come into contact with me. I can help you with that. So words with similar meanings have similar representation. That is if a word is like cat. So dog would be somewhere around that word because that's also an animal. So king, queen, these would have a different context than cat and dog, but they would be in different clusters. Like you'll see the figures in the other slides. So in this project, we saw that there's a notable spike in mentions of 5G after the COVID was designated as a pandemic in March, on March 11. So you see there was a huge spike. Um, and in also in early April, when there were reports of cell tower attacks and harassment of telecom workers. So April saw another big spike 
and that was mostly news but also some conspiracies so and now the top five most common hashtags in january and in first 15 days of april you can see that in january it was around 5g ai iot UI. so those are just tech terms but when the pandemic grew and grew and there was more of COVID, so we saw that uh, in, in, the, in the top hashtags, COVID-19 and coronavirus were also included. It, that was the second top and that was, Corona was the fourth one. So what I did in this project, this part was done by the other PhD students. This part I did because I have some expertise in word, word embeddings and word to and stuff. So, okay, what are these graphs? First, I'll explain some of that. These are TSNE graphs, basically distributed stochastic network embeddings. Well, these graphs, as I told you, that the embedding vectors of different words when you use word embeddings, so the dimensions, dimensions are huge, like 300, 400. We cannot visualize all that stuff, so, but we need to see for the results. So there's a technique called dimensionality reduction which reduces something of a very high dimensional vector like if it's if its dimension is 300 or something like that it can be reduced to two dimensional space that's what we did using the uh, word vectors within the different tweets we we projected it on a 2d plane and plotted the different you know the terms that were occurring in most of the tweets now in feb 2020 you can see that the clusters are around innovation, services, trade, encryption, deceiving. These are tech terms. So it wasn't must, mo, uh, these are not terms related to any conspiracy theory or any, you know, misinformation. But come April 2020, and you can see clusters of conspiracy here in the words, psychopaths, concern, tracking, attack, attack, Corona conspiracy. So this shows that there is a clear agenda or clear misinformation spread within uh, Twitter around the 5G and COVID thing. So we collected 5G tweets and then within those 5G tweets, we all got Corona conspiracy risk, psychopaths attack emerging all of a sudden in April. So this is something very interesting to visualize, to see in, in the form of a beautiful graph and it's something that word embeddings does very easily it's just one just five or six lines of code and if you have the data and this is another heat map so what was done is the terms tech phone innovation 5g and startup we saw which ones have the similar pattern of all these and in this, you can see that 5G is the odd one out in January. So it had started to happen because within these tech terms, 5G merged out as the odd one. But in March 2020, innovation is the odd one out. And you can see that COVID is now there with 5G and phone and tech. So you can see the pattern of the conspiracy theory emerging as Corona spread and spread more and it was affecting public more and it came more into the news. So as things come more into the news, people tweet more about it. And everyone, like I said, everyone becomes a journalist without any authentication, without any substance, and they keep spreading this stuff. And we saw this phenomena that how we can see it as proof in, in word embeddings. So this is still a work in progress. We will publish it hopefully soon and you can access it. But it was a very interesting project and I really enjoyed it. And also with major implications for public health, for you know, tracking of conspiracies on Twitter and stuff. So yeah, one more thing. Oh, sorry, I was working on this slide. So there's a publicly available data set on tweets by Emil, Dr. Emilio Ferrara. I can give you the link later in the chat. So this uh, data set is basically for anyone who wants to work on Twitter on conspiracy theories, fake news detection, or COVID. So all those tweets that in that publicly available data set are related to the coronavirus tweets, and it's something that you can uh, play around with. So that's it for my talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. That, that was really, really good. Thank you.
All right, I'll stop the sharing. Yeah, any questions? Um, let's see. Mm, it doesn't seem like it, at least not so far. Mm. All right. So if anyone wants to ask later, you can ask me on Twitter or email, or if you want the papers. I understand this was more research centric stuff. Is the data gathered just from Twitter or different platforms? Uh, just Twitter. For this project, just Twitter. We can do from different platforms and I think other researchers are doing it. There's also a Kaggle data set uh, on research papers published on COVID and stuff you can see in Kaggle. But for the purpose of this work was just Twitter. Would it be difficult to get it from Facebook? Yes, because Facebook's API is very, very tricky and limited now. It, it wasn't like that in 2010, but now they restrict. But still, we can use whatever is available publicly. Like if you go to the Irish Times public page, the comment section and all, you can get those still. Yeah. And other uh, networks like YouTube, like the comments on YouTube? Oh, those, are, those are easy to get. Those are not so hard. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. I just um, I have another question there. Uh, just uh, you can just uh, tell us uh, about WIMLDS for a moment or two. Oh yeah. Well, this was something that you know we all at Insight, uh, my colleagues and myself, we all worked in Insight Center for Data Analytics and UCD, and uh, we have seen a lot of machine learning researchers. Uh, who are men and who give different talks from time to time but the women in this whole space are very few but they they do exist we know them and they are working in insight with us in ucd there's also uh, a lot of accomplished women researchers and we ourselves are working so we thought that to increase the participation of women and other you know minority groups we need to do something so claudia who is the founder of it she uh, brought up this idea to make the Dublin chapter and we said, oh, why not? We'll be interested. And then we approached the uh, WIMDLS, the main, who leads the world over in, starting from the US. And she said that all we need to do is have four people. We already had them and uh, <clears throat> set up a website with the profile descriptions and all, have some events every four months and that's it it can be of an informal coffee even just like your events you know pi data and stuff so we'll be having ours soon uh, so hopefully we'll let you know and we'll be sure to post that so that's a uh, women in machine learning and data science yeah and it's the there's the international website there's chapters around the world all the way in india and botswana and britain and ireland and usa and it's wimlds.org, is that right? Yes. Okay, good stuff. So. Any other questions about the slides or talk? Not so much a question, but an interesting comment that um, psychopath and all that kind of stuff is starting to crop up lately. Uh, yeah. With Donald Trump going into final gear with all this, so people are <laughs> very worried about that. They are, they are. <laughs> Like, you would be surprised at the approach that some countries, like even Boris Johnson, he was in denial for so long. And look at what it cost the UK. And so many lives. It's tough. Yeah. It's amazing what conspiracies can do to your mind. Well, I think there's another factor there. I noted that in Ireland, for example, where it's a public health system and where everyone would be guaranteed a bed no matter what shape you go in we would be very worried about that getting overloaded because if there was a massive surge, we would never cope with everybody needing hot towel. As opposed to America, they need healthcare. So like, they're not going to bring you in off the street. If you're sick, you're going to stay there unless you have the right healthcare package in place. So they can actually afford to take the focus off social distancing now and back into working. As you're about to see in my slides, they're financially crippled <laughs> at the moment. So. It's about to come tumbling down for them. But um, yeah, 
hugely interesting talk. I'd love actually to see if you could point that at YouTube because some of the conversations get more uh, aggressive there more quickly. <laughs> So that, that would be very interesting to see what kind of words pop out on YouTube, on particular channels. Like. All right. Yeah, that could be an interesting idea. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, That's it. Thank you very, much. very much. Yeah, that was amazing. Hello. Thank you. You're welcome. And then do you think it would be a good idea to take maybe like two minutes break or you want to go straight into uh, coronavirus fine post coronavirus finance in the US. Mm -hmm. People might want to get a can or a pint or something into them there. <laughs> or a cup of tea yeah, or a I biscuit. I think that's yeah. a good idea, yeah. So maybe <laughs> let's say three minutes. I mean the commutes are very short these days. So three minutes I think yeah. would be a good time, right? <laughs> yeah. Twelve yards to the toilet and ten yards to the kitchen. Perfect. So we come back in three minutes then with Niall. Very good. Yeah. Cool. I would love to know where our lovely attendees are from. I can see some people here. Well, I know I know Chuck. Hello, Chuck again. Um, I don't recognize the other names. I can see some people here. Well, I know I know Chuck. Yeah. Got the YouTube on mute on my other screen. Okay. Oh, that was you. Ooh. So we have a Ukraine. Oh, cool. It's Svet Svetlana. Is that how I say, how you say it properly? Atlanta, yeah, that name sounds familiar. Uh, she's watching us. Yeah, she's from Ukraine. Hello. If the folks at home want to do a video or come up with a presentation, we'll try. Well, we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're sort of. We start Pi Data in Ireland. This is the first effort, and so hopefully people at home will get excited that they can, uh, you know, present something uh, over the course of the year, and we'll put it up on YouTube and we'll promote it. And you know, you you can get invited or get get applied to go to Pi Data's around Europe, like Berlin and Paris and stuff like that. And you get to get your, your your mother will be able to tell people she, you're doing a lecture tour of Europe and they'll be, she'll be very proud. So, you know, there we go. Yeah, I should just say, I, should just say how I, I, I didn't think I was pronouncing it right, but good to know. Very good. I have a friend from Ukraine, so maybe that's it. I just got a little bit of the accent. But yes, we would love to host you guys. To have if you have anything cool to show us on Pi Data, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be Pi Data Dublin. Um, we would love to have you. And I think our three minutes are up. I think it's time to get it around again. Will I share my screen now? Yeah. I think it's time now. So um, I prepared a very cool introduction for you then. So, uh, <laughs> uh. so perfect. So welcome back everyone. So we're back for track two on the first edition of Remote Pi Data Dublin. And now we have Niall O'Connor and Niall has a CS major. Uh, he works at a bank, uh, he likes to bake, he grows vegetables in his back garden and he also has a very good experience to talk about coronavirus because he got coronavirus last year, still in 2019, so he was not one of the first ones. And he is going to talk to us a little bit about training bots, signals and AI. Excited about this. Thank Welcome, you. Mario. 
Uh, first of all, I thought Arjun Man's talk was really, really good. Um, that is a very important uh, topic. Fake news is a really dangerous thing. Actual fake news, not people calling real things fake news. Um, if you can see my screen, I'm going to jump onto my slides now. Oh, let me get up to the start. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll expand these. I'm not sure if I need to, but sure. We'll go with it. Now, um, I had an idea for a talk on trading a while back. And I had often wondered, what is the secret of trading? And um, rather than approach it from a data point of view, I created a trading account in the, using the Investopedia simulator game. Where you're given $100,000 or $10,000, whichever you choose. And then you have to uh, try and make money out of that. So I opened that account last September and I just broke $400,000 there today. So it's a pretty good return. Um, and I've been trying to teach a machine how to do it, but unfortunately, uh, I've been hampered many times. So, so I'm going to go through some of the problems I've seen with trying to do this thing um, and some of the sort of, I suppose not failures, but the reasons that other people who've attempted this don't have much success because um, they're probably not as familiar with the problem. Um, so what is the goal of trading? Uh, to make lots of money while not breaking the risk appetite would be uh, Bank of America's uh, statement on that. Uh, anybody out there who's trying to buy and sell stuff on the stock market, obviously they want to make money and obviously they want to make as much money as they can. Um, but there are rules in place that prohibit them from doing certain things. Good rules uh, for good reasons. And a lot of these things might not be understood by people who want to trade. Um, but the first thing is that traders will trade anything and everything they can get their hands on and often many things at once. And so one of the approaches I often see where people uh, try and crack trading is they will examine a trend for a company like Amazon and figure out when to buy it just with one stock. And, and that's, that's not going to get you very far. Be, and we'll see that in a second. Um, so things that you can buy and sell if you're in the world of finance uh, where they are short on a lot of computer programmers. Incidentally, if anyone knows Cobalt, you're going to be worth a lot of money in the next few months. Um, so things you can buy and sell, you can buy and sell stock. That's what Apple and Microsoft and all these guys have and Facebook. Um, an option to buy or sell a stock, which is like a little ticket that you get. Say this is a ticket here and it gives you an option to buy it at a certain price. And if the stock becomes way less uh, valued than that price, you're not going to buy it for a high price. Just throw away the ticket. It's not needed anymore. A future contract, very important to a farmer. Um, I guarantee I'll pay you next year for that uh, corn or that beef or whatever it is, and you get the money up front to go off and make the commodity. Sometimes people just want to buy straight up commodities like oil or, or gold or something like that. Uh, forward trades, I want to buy it in a year and we'll agree the price today and I'll buy it in a year for that price. Bonds, you give me a loan, I'll pay you back the loan plus a bit of interest. And when, when you give me that loan, I give you a bond, which is a meaningless piece of paper, but uh, it's a special type of loan. And you can go off and say that I'm a AAA rated guy, guaranteed to pay you, legally obliged to pay you. And all of that money plus the interest I'm going to give you is now an asset to you. Uh, that's a dangerous thing where a loan becomes an asset. Um, but corporations, sovereigns, which are countries and municipals, states or cities like Barcelona City or Detroit City would use bonds. So they're the actual things you can buy and sell. But what guys more often than not want to do is sign on the dotted line for the agreement and then sell their signature, sell that slot, that position. So someone else can strike the deal and if it's looking really lucrative, they could say, hey, do you want to buy into my end of the deal before it comes to fruition and you're guaranteed to make a lot of money and they can sell out early for a smaller amount of the profit. Um, and the last major thing, which is definitely, ooh, the signal, for us in the world that, we're, that we're, we're at the end of this huge stock bubble, is selling your assets, which is any of these things, overnight for cash. It's called a repurchase agreement or a repo. It's like pawning 24 hours, 72 hours, depends on what the agreement is. And that stuff is really, really dangerous. Um, so there are the things you can buy and sell. And buying and selling lots of them is what a good trading algorithm needs to do. And in order to buy and sell lots of things, you're going to need a lot of data. And this is a Pi Data talk. So I came to the right place. So a single stock is not just a trend. Um, I'm going to have to duck out of this slide here for a second. So this is an Amazon stock. A year ago, it was worth that much money. And today, 
it's worth a considerable bit more. It was $1,858 a year ago, $2,409 today. It gained $550 over the year uh, on the 1858. That's 29%. So that's okay. It's not bad. Uh, you and I as a stockholder will never see that dividend at all. Um, Amazon keep that money took close. But um, if you look at the Amazon stock on Google, you can see that going from there to there is a difference of $550. There was a lot more money to be made than that across the year. If you bought there, for example, in March, just before Patrick's Day, and sold today, you would be a lot richer. There's, there's nearly $700 or more in the difference there. So trading bots and algorithms, a lot of guys want to just buy the stock and then sell it and buy it again and hold it for a while and sell it. That's called going long, where I think it's going to increase in value, so I'll buy it so I can sell it in the future. But agreeing to sell it today for a price and then being allowed to buy it for any from any point in the future where it might be worth less money. That's a short sale. So if Amazon stock was worth 1858 on the 20th of May last year, and a couple of weeks later it was only worth 1692, buying it when it was worth 1858 and selling it, so sorry, agreeing to sell it when it's 1858 and buying it to cover the sale when it's only 1692 means you're up a couple of hundred dollars there. So short sales are important. And they give you access to the absolute movement of the stock. Every movement up and down is potentially a gain to you. So when you tot up, and I didn't tot up every single movement, but I totted up the major ones from the lows to the highs and some of the choppy bits in between, where there's like 50 up and 50 down to be made. Um, it's a lot more. Uh, if I tot up all these numbers, and I did on, on a Linux desktop, I'm on Windows now presenting this, uh, there was 3,000... $258 worth of movement in total on the stock. And if you add that on top of the 1858, it would be the same as the stock traveling in a straight line to a price of 5117. It's 275% of, of an increase there. So that would be a success for a trading bot, not 4% or 10%. Inflation might go beyond 4% or 10%. In fact, a bank would give you 4% maybe on a deposit account. Um, and they can afford to do that. So when you're looking at a stock and reading it, you really want to read every single move up and down, and you want to be able to engage on a trade up and down. You won't be able to engage on every single trade, but a lot of them. And this chart here that I showed you was the yearly chart. But what happens, I mean, within a day, for example, like you can see here today, the stock market has been all over the shop. An unknown stock, Sabre here, up almost 8% at one point, back down now to 5%. I think they were even up 10% or, you know, it's only 6% here earlier. But um, that is a huge jump out of the, the bat and up and down today. So a lot of money to be made if you could have bought here, sold here, short sold to here, bought to here, short sold, etc. Um, like if you stretch out that line, there's an animal amount of money to be made. Um, so intraday trading is even more lucrative than end of day trading, uh, which is more lucrative than you know, investing money, sinking money for a few months in the stock and taking it back out. So if there's lots of money to be made on the movement during the day, how do you find the signal to tell you when to move? So, so we know what we want to look at. We know what granularity we want to look at it. We understand that there's moves both up and down that we can make money on. The question is, how the hell do we know when to make the move? And this is where some of the fails creep in. Um, where, where the people, the concept they have in their head is, is not entirely correct for what they're trying to do for the problem they're trying to solve. Because it's not just a data problem, data comes into it later. Um, so there is the stock. Intraday movement is the important thing. The goals of this game. Um, for every tick, for every stock, whether it's a daily tick or an hourly tick or a minute tick, you want to know the price coming into it, the price going out of it, the open and close, and the high low. And um, as uh, Erdogan said earlier, candlestick graph is your answer to that question. You've probably seen a lot of these for stocks. Some of you probably know what they are. Some of you might have never seen them before, don't know what they are. Uh, very simply, the price at which the stock enters and exits is the open close, and the bar represents that difference. If it opened low and closed high, it's green, it's positive, it's good, or it's white in the, in the kind of traditional method. 
And the absolute minimum the stock went to during that time period and the absolute maximum is the high low. So the line represents the total movement. So it may have opened, at some point got a lot lower, at some point got incredibly high and closed out somewhere here. Um, the opposite, when you're losing, is uh, it opens high, but it went low, closed at a lower price there. And again, the total movement high and lower there. Bullish, bullish means people want to buy or go long that's just a financial term, bull market, good long market. Bearish market, people don't want to buy. They're trying to stash their money somewhere else. They're very cautious. Uh, shorting, things like that, or short selling is a thing that happens in bear markets. So bullish, bearish, you'll hear the words thrown around. It's just investors trying to confuse you with jargon in the hope you won't understand. Um, but that candlestick graph and understanding the candlestick brings you to your most important tool to find a signal a Bollinger Band. Uh, anybody doing data has probably seen this before. Anybody who hasn't probably hasn't. Bollinger Band is a way of measuring how far a stock is deviating away from an average. The Bollinger Band I've used here is a 20-day rolling average, and I'm interested in it moving two standard deviations from that. And that gives me that picture. For that stock, Sabre, that's hugely important because you can see that stock shot outside that band entirely and skim the edge of it for a long while up here. And you'll notice that at its peak, the lower Bollinger band, the blue bit on the bottom, actually starts to turn normally on the peak. It's strange that, but that's just the way it works. Um, and the, the, the upper and lower bounds begin to track up with the stock. And then the stock usually will turn and it has to regress back, which is a very important thing I'll touch on. Um, and move again. Bollinger bands usually inflate, and after a period of inflation, they contract quite tightly, and then inflate again and contract and inflate, contract, inflate, contract. Um, a slow moving stock, if I was to reorganize this chart and look at DIA, which is the Dow Industrial Average, and um, that Bollinger band would be almost you know, flat either side of that today. Very steady graph. But I, I wanted to highlight this stock here more. Um, the question is. At this point here, was the stock going to turn and go down or this point here? And that's the signal you have to try and look for to make money out of algorithmic trading. That is a really tricky thing to do. Um, so there are some guys here. First of all, for Bollinger Bands, I threw a link into the page if anyone hasn't done one before. They're incredibly easy to do in Python because the language is just very easy to program with. Um, if you, oh, whatever, get that out of there. If you're using Scikit, learn or you're using pandas or any of these very easy to do sometimes it's automatically in there but um in pandas here uh, simply using the mean and the standard deviation for a 20-day rolling window is the easiest way to get the the upper band and the lower band programmed in um so that link is in the slides you can see it there applied to facebook i'm allergic to because we're a really bad company but um so uh and there's a, an even better illustrated graph if, if you couldn't see the picture clearly, but there it is there with the Bollinger Band and the mean, uh, the, the rolling average for that stock and the stock in blue. So regression to the mean is how you make money in this game here. So the easiest way to do this is to think of coin tosses. So if I toss a coin, you will say it's a 50-50 chance it's going to be head or tails, which is only true in the entire infinity of the universe for all the coin tosses. Uh, the wave function for an event that has two outcomes of equal weight is 50-50. But it doesn't mean every to coin toss is gonna strictly obey that. I could go around the corner, and I know you won't believe me, but toss six heads in a row, and then come back into the room and say to you, what do you think, heads or tails? And it is more likely to be a tail than a head. And you think that's BS, but it's not. If I exaggerate the example, if I go around the corner and toss a coin for half of the existence of the universe and toss only heads, I know that the other, every other toss in this coin for the rest of the universe's existence must be a tail to balance out the wave function or something's horrifically wrong with a normal distribution. So in the same way that this stock shot off there, it had to come back at some point because you know, I mean, it will shoot off for, 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 a, for a very good reason. Something good happened in the news. Someone might have had a breakthrough in COVID. Their stock's going through the roof. 
Someone might have agreed a trade deal. Uh, something else might have suddenly become cheaper. It might be a breakthrough announced somewhere else. Someone had a good quarter of profit. Those things will always drive a stock price, but only so much and it has to regress back a little bit. Because overall, if I go on the kind of a one-year plot, things follow a more steadier curve over time. Uh, this stuff here is 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 not good, right? This is this is this is Donald Trump's bull market being tweeted to absolute pieces over Christmas. Rally, 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 rally. COVID nineteen. Oh shit! We're not actually doing anything. We're staying home from work. Massive, massive topple right down, and then this ridiculous massive surge back out of it. Um, with investors in, in the States going absolutely crazy as if opening back up the country was going to be like WrestleMania 10 and it was going to equal as millions of dollars all of a sudden. Um, these stocks are all US centric. They're New York Stock Exchange. They're NASDAQ stocks. They're the only ones available in the Investopedia game. There's my, my, my game there and my trade history. Um, so they're the stocks I deal with. If you, if you look at European stocks, they're going to be much different. They're not going to have this wild bullish streak in them. But um, that's the gotcha. So uh, so regression to the mean is your key thing to make money. Never try and worry about the money you lost when the thing suddenly shot up. Be ready to make money when it has to drop back down, when it has to regress to the mean. Um, that's why the money I've made is not through the roof. It, I mean, if I caught every single curve along the year, I probably would have a million out of the 100,000, but it's impossible to do that. I can just catch what's coming back. Um, so that's how you would do it. You want to build a trading bot. You want to solve the problem. You'd have to get the stock. You'd have to get the candlestick graph for every minute. You would have to use something like the Bollinger Bands to plot the deviation and see when it moves out so far enough away from the mean that it's going to have a regression. You'd have to pull it back. It's not always right. Sometimes it can we'll see in a second. Um, as the previous talk alluded, fake news and Twitter has way too heavy an effect on this nowadays. Um, but one of the other goals is you can't really do it well with one stock. As you can see, I have a cluster of stocks here and they all, they all have some very interesting things you can't see at this point. I'll just I'll kind of zoom in a little bit because yeah, there you go. Now you can see it a little better there. So when one goes down, one goes up. And sometimes many of them go up together. So uh, gold usually when gold is doing well, it means everything else is declining. So you can see when Sabre began to drop there shortly after um, Xerox began to drop and gold was steadily starting to make the increase. And then when Xerox had a turn of fortune, gold steadied off. And you can see again, as gold was doing well, the Russell Hobbs IWM uh, index was doing bad and then it picked itself back up. And the, the um, S&P 500 Dow and all these guys, they didn't have much of an effect on that. It would be there. It's just not very pronounced in that line. But you can see a very slight bow from that position over to there. So some stocks are perfectly inverted. Some are covariant. Some move a proportion of the other. But they all have some kind of correlation. Unfortunately, it can flip rapidly if something changes in the world. An earthquake in one place can make everyone flip one way together. Or another and these things are impossible to avoid so um so you got to use many stocks because the chances of them all moving completely out of kilter at one time are very slim so the goal is to trade a lot of stocks that correlate and try and find signals between them now uh, this is something i did try and do and um, you need minute by minute data and data was being scraped for weeks on end from various sources around the world while you could get it minute by minute it would be held for a few days and tried to correlate between the stocks but at the time corona was breaking out into the world and it was absolutely impossible to nail a signal amongst all the noise so maybe in a few months when thing can, things calm down it might be possible to train a learning algorithm to accurately spot when these things turn and the hinge points for each of these um correlations um but the signals can change if something changes in the world so what we knew before corona may not actually apply afterwards it can change very abruptly when that oaf in the White House takes to a phone, suddenly announces something that's true or not true, or not even close to true. And um, so Trump tweets, again, I would love to actually spend some time with Irishman and our researchers and have a look at what actually goes on on Twitter in terms of stocks. I'd say it would overlay very well onto these data sets. But uh, when Elon Musk got high on Joe Rogan's podcast very famously, 
and then not so long after announced he had private uh, investors to take the company back off the stock market. He made Tesla stock move incredibly huge. And uh, and if anyone doesn't watch Tesla stock, uh, which I might go back here and have a look at, Tesla stock is the craziest stock of all. The range of motions it goes through based on the nonsense that Elon Musk tweets. Uh, I suppose it's not all nonsense, but <laughs> yeah, in the last six months, um, some of the spikes going from like $400, $300 in the end of last year, shooting all the way up to $800, $900, dropping down back up. And a lot of this stuff wasn't just, you know, off the back of Corona. That spike there was a crazy one. I remember that day because it did a drop from over $800, you know, $140 drop just based off madness that he was tweeting at at the time. Um, and his fall from Gray started in February the 19th, not March the 16th, which is down here. Um, so he, he actually moved randomly a lot more before anyone else did um, and has picked back up to somewhere around here. But uh, that, is, that is not the way any kind of market should behave. That's incredibly unhealthy if that's happening. And it's a, it's a real danger sign for the rest of the planet. All your pensions and everything are all caught up in that. So um, him, COVID-19, investors plainly living in cuckoo land. Just this bounce back that you're seeing here for all stocks. Absolutely insane that the underlying economy and manufacturing sectors, the service sectors and unemployment numbers are not even closely telling us that number. So uh, that'll bring me to a point later on. Uh, lying is a really bad thing. Um, repurchase activity. Last September when we thought the stock market would collapse, the end of October actually, uh, that should have happened. In September, all of these companies traded all their assets, loans, bonds, any rubbish they had for cash overnight to shore up their books as they did the end of the Q3 figures. And they've actually been limping along with that for a long while. And now the Fed is starting to pull a plug in it. So um, that has masked the problem for a long while. That's incredibly hard to deal with in data because getting access to repo markets is a really difficult thing to do is really difficult to charity activity and it has a massive effect on the stock market. So there's a signal you're blind to that scuppers that. Um, but in amongst the attempts, the, the kind of failish attempts, which uh, they're technically a fail if you're trying to make money, but I think they're really interesting work and what these guys have been trying to do is where to look. And um, this guy's tried to predict the stock market movement. Um, his real stock market movement versus his prediction is very close, but unfortunately, uh, his prediction always lags by a day, which is really difficult. You'll never make money off that. And, and that's, you know, I suppose, in a way, that's sort of the idea. But um, even at a day behind, if for certain situations, if his predictability really is as good as he's showing here, um, that's incredible work. Probably better applied to weather, where it's all right to be a day late with that. Not for the stock market, but um, very interesting post. A lot of code up there, uh, very well explained. Worth a read if you want to have a look at that. Um, and another guy building an AI trading bot for free, more of an event-driven system. To be honest, it's done in Quantopian, but this guy is trying to show you how to do it at home and run it uh, on a cloud somewhere in Python. Um, he boasts he makes 20%, but you know anyone can say a number. But he's got the basics of spotting a signal here, um, but I don't think there's enough correlation and enough not looking at enough signals it doesn't really work well on one stock but still it's interesting work it could probably be expanded on um, and be of real use uh, the data bit which i did want to talk about uh, is a very difficult thing to do so in bank of america we did try and do this a few years ago we had a platform called quartz and we stored our data as living objects in an object database and the idea was you never you didn't store prices in a table in a dead database and just have them there archived and um, anytime you wanted to price the object everything that hinged on it all of the other factors correlations trends whatever it was were represented in a graph some of the things were pieces of data some of them were actual functions that were calculated on the fly but when you asked for the price right there and then at that moment it gave you the live price as best it could and that is incredibly difficult and it's not a great system real time it requires a lot of cpu power to make it work well real time it's a very expensive system to run as anyone who would work with me or has worked with me before would know but it's the closest thing i've ever seen to being able to model the problem properly and uh, maybe in the future when cpu power goes up it would become a better thing but um 
it's a very, very difficult, can't go into it because it's proprietary, but um, using graphs with living functions on them and other pieces of data and connecting them into all kinds of systems all over the world to actually get an accurate price in the stock is just not feasible for the, the average Joe. Um, which brings me to the last bit. If you're ever going to get involved in this, do the fake one first. Don't put your money on the line. Don't buy into crypto. Do not buy into crypto. Do not believe crypto. Crypto is a cult. Please do not fall into that. Um, they are your enemies out there, crypto cults. Uh, they sing about the money being up. They never sing about it when it goes down. Investment firms are up against you. They have huge leverage. An investment firm can waltz into the market tomorrow and buy the crap out of a certain stock and just completely bully the price one way or another. They're not supposed to, but they can. And it's difficult to catch them when they do that. Social media, like I said, one of the most impossible things to plot a signal from has a massive effect on everything in the world. Uh, it may not matter to you now, but anyone who's close to retirement, Corona, for example, and the misinformation that's stopping it from being fought properly, and the real information which is getting buried, and the effect it's had in the stock market, that is really going to tarnish people's uh, investment. Anyone retiring in the next three to five years, that's like, going to be very difficult. They're going to have lost a lot. Um, accounting ninjas, people who cook the books and keep companies looking good. Anyone who's seen the big short, the ratings agencies openly uh, took bribes, basically, um, to keep the ratings of the mortgage-backed securities as appearing as high even though they weren't. And there was a huge chapter in that in that movie, in the book, and uh, who you would see in the movie. So um, if the people rating the value of these things don't want to rate them any worse than, than they would like, you've got no hope against that. And who's got your back? No one's got your back in these situations. I would like to say that in all the work I've done, blockchain, I actually did find a use case for blockchain, and it's not storing uh, bitcoins, which are of absolutely no value because you can't eat them. And I can't bring them to a supermarket here and buy food or flour to make bread. So they're utterly useless to me and, and anyone else, really. But um, the blockchain database, which records transactions in a way that, once it's agreed, it can't be tampered with, is probably the most vital tool to bringing order to the stock market. If labor, materials, time, energy, and effort were recorded and logged and ledgered in the blockchain, it would be impossible to argue against them. It would be very possible to make accurate predictions about stocks and prices. You wouldn't have a market that's hell-bent on growing. It wouldn't be able to grow so quick. You'd have a flat economy where things are managed as in there's always enough supply to meet the demand, which is actually the goal of any stock market in ancient China and India and Greece. This is how it was done. Um, so that is a huge use case for blockchain. I really hope blockchain people actually uh, bring that to the fore. The last thing I'll say is, uh, I said the blockchain bit, uh, the Greek philosophy stated that life is a struggle and a toil, but when you accept it, it's actually great fun. And the American philosophy deludes people into believing there's a better state for everyone and that every person is entitled and has a right to reach that state. And it is basically the Greek nightmare. And if anyone did wonder where Corona or COVID came from, it was warned about for years by the WHO that having children work in cobalt mines to mine the materials for your batteries and having basically slave labor, people working for the minimum, minimum wage in a factory all day, traveling home in huge numbers and crammed public transport, living in poverty, living in, on top of each other, three and four families in the house. Flu always lives in those areas. It always stays alive. Your immune system is weak and not really up to getting rid of it. And it lives from person to person in, in those poverty impoverished conditions and has been warned for years that places like China, parts of Africa, parts of India, parts of South America, just where it's not well economically development, is highly likely to have an outbreak like this at some point. And it's very coincidental to me that when the stock market reaches its highest high, that this thing comes out when the, when the world economy is running to the bone, uh, overly hot for, for so long. So I think we should all look at how many phones we've bought in the last few years and how many we really needed to buy and ask ourselves the question, was it worth it? And on that horrible note, making you all feel shame, I'm going to leave it right there and stink you out of it <laughs> and hand it back for questions if anyone would like to ask a question to me. But I don't think anyone will. Well, oh, no, I've got loads for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, dear. I just get question juice here. 
No, that'll help. There is one in the Q&A as well. There is okay. not Python related. So if, yeah. you don't wanna, if you don't wanna reply. Uh, so no Georg Georgios is asking, um, which broker do you use? Ah, so on Investopedia, I'm doing, I, I execute the trades. Investopedia is not real, it's a game. It's 15 minutes behind Bloomberg, which means it's live with Yahoo or Google or any of these things. And it's the easiest way to go learn about it. You won't be imposed with any limits. You can spend your money what way you want. Certain margin rules don't apply. If I did use a broker, um, I don't know which one I'd use. I'd look for the app with the cheapest fees, obviously, and the one that allows me to trade the most. But like, it's one thing doing it when it's your money. And it's one thing doing it when it's fake money. When it's your money, just like what I showed you there, with those stocks took years of me working in the bank. I just took a crack at it at the end. That's the end result of reading lots about how things correlate. And like, I'll be honest with you, spending hours in the morning on market watching, it's like serious study. It's like a continual PhD. Not that it's impossible. I'm not saying anything big about me, but it's just really nerdy, detailed read of it. And if you don't have that uh, passion for it, just be careful because you could sink a lot of money down and lose. Like, you can't get it back once you've lost it. I could restart that game again if it went really bad. But, and you know, in previous years when I did learn and started out four or five years ago, I did delete games. I didn't do well in them. Like, I got creamed in a couple of months. So please don't do that with your own money unless you're very, very sure. Because they're all crooks, all of them. I can tell you. Good stuff. I think actually, just for the sake of safety, I should point out that you're expressing your own personal preference opinion that we can't. Yeah. We, yeah. We're, we're not. Uh, they're not uh, necessarily endorsed by anyone else. That no, just, I'm not endorsed by anyone else. But but what I would say is remember that um, like a good example of a forward is imagine uh, the Chicago Bulls are playing a game of basketball and they're ten points up at halftime, and I have a ticket that says they're going to win. At halftime, that looks like a really good bet. And if there was 20 bucks to be made on that bet, I could say, here, do you want to buy this ticket for 10 off me? And you can win the other 10 at the end of this game. Now, the game hasn't finished yet. And I'm at halftime giving you the option to go on and win it. I'm trying to get out with some money in my pocket. But if it goes incredibly wrong, you know, you're, you're taking the loss on that. So, and, and, and also, if, if it's a thing that the, the game score is moving up and down and up and down and it has moved up and down, if it's been tit for tat, I may have the feeling that Chicago Bulls are going to go on and win and you may think that the Lakers are going to go on and win and we have two completely opposing views while we're looking at the same data. It's called split-screen syndrome. Um, it happens if, if the Nazis looked at a war movie and the Allies looked at a war movie. Both of them see completely different things, but it's the same movie. When Donald Trump says something on TV, his supporters would say, thank God he's there, he's saving us all, he's back. Other people would say, oh my God, we're, you know, coronavirus is what it is, but some people see 5G and some people see social distancing as a good thing. So what I say in the stock market is, like, they're not uh, obviously crooks because uh, they haven't been proven in, in court to be crooks, but they may, have a, they may be betting heavily against something or they may be trying to sell something to you and tell you, a particular story but like you know be very careful you're betting against out there just that that's what i mean by that it is a hugely 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 gray area and it's money it's not lego or a uh, you know or badges that you're trading with it's real cash could be your future i've, I've i know people who've lost everything on on crypto and that, you know that was their that was their nest egg and nothing i could do to convince them of that Good stuff. Um, just uh, sort of, uh, uh, let's say, I just sort of, uh, you're in a great position to answer some really interesting questions. More so, more general topics rather than, uh, first off, actually, it's about if uh, somebody was interested in getting into finance using Python, like quantitative finance right now, what sort of future do you have, think they would have? Let's say it's a first year student in a college and they're that's what they want to do in life. Maybe it's a big brother or a big sister told them to do quantitative finance and learn Python. Do you think the world is going to be different now? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, like, like that entire uh, stretch there about honesty 
and then crypto and all of that stuff um, and blockchain and all of that stuff. Python, like it is, it has been for years. It's one of the, if there's any tutorial out there, Python's probably the easiest one to learn. To get it down and running on your laptop, it's easy. To get it out on the cloud and running, it's very easy. Um, it's always been an easy language to spool up and get running. There's a lot of companies are fond of that now. Like Revolut, for example, have a lot of Python back end of them. They're, they're a digital payments platform, which is another big, massive future for everyone. But, um, but a lot of the ideas are easy to implement in Python because you're thinking more about the idea than you're worrying about the management of the code. I've often found in Java, you, you get bogged into trying to straighten Java out first before you get the problem done. And for that reason, a lot of people go, they're, they're more worried about the, the carpentry and the joining on the corner than what's at the end when the house is built. So um, Python is a huge advantage for that. But the second thing is there's a lot of articles out there with a lot of examples on finance on Python. There's a lot of interesting things that aren't finance related, but actually are very similar concepts to finance going on in, in the machine learning circles in a lot of the Python talks. So, I mean, if you're young and you have any interest in this stuff, if you are excited by gambling or betting or the stock market, and you're into Python, uh, just reach out to the community and get connected to people. But bet, betting companies, gambling companies, online gambling companies, banks, investment firms, hedge funds, any of those guys um, would be interested in you in another few years. But a lot of the smaller firms that are starting up, digital banking, global payments, the revolutes and the stripes of the world, they're, they're going to be interested in people who have skills in that too. And at some point, they're going to want to move into banking. Because when you're holding on to money in the middle, there's a possibility for you to make uh, a few pounds on that. And anyone who's uh, got ahead for that, if you have a few more years experience and you know anything about risk management or anything in, in banking terms, business-wise, uh, central banking type stuff, you'll, you'll be in demand pretty soon for that. Great stuff. Just a sort of second question. Um, uh, following on from like... A, giving advice to a career young professional, let's say you had to give them a quick shopping list, like they still want to do finance, let's say, but like give them a quick shopping list of things to have in their CV, things to be able to talk about eloquently in an interview. Uh, Python related, like for example, pandas, numpy, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Panda's the most applicable one to anywhere in a bank. Uh, to the ability to be able to pick up any piece of tabular data and slice and slap it around and pandas is hugely, uh, a hugely common thing. It's one of the most used things you'll do. Um, you can probably do some of it in Excel, but if you, if you want it to run automatically, you're going to want to do it in something like Python and Pandas. After that, Monte Carlo stuff, very useful. If you go into Quantopian platform, there's a great amount of Python resources there. It is on their own API, but it will teach you the concepts. But um, any any kind of forecasting simulation that doesn't rely so heavily on data because it's not kind of closed form solution stuff, you're trying to make predictions to fill in the gaps. That's something worth getting into. Um, part of it is a little bit rock, rocket science but it's okay. And then on the data front, just any, like, doesn't have to be finance, gathering weather data. I mean, the, the social media talk before was brilliant. That's a prime example of going out there like that. That would be under geopolitical risk or social risk, which, you know, is a thing that affects stock markets. But being able to garnish large amounts of data, work with APIs, crunch it down, present it, um, just remember what it is at the end you're trying to present, that kind of stuff, that kind of uh, hobbyist interest in that curiosity about the world. That talks volume is more than anything in an interview. If it was even only about the history of Formula One races and whatever metrics of that you wanted to do, it could easily be applied to anything else. Anyone that shows that kind of initiative, take the hand off them and all get them in the door. Um, you know, it's the hobbies are where the, the main skills are at. It's not just regurgitating years of experience and I did this and that in this project. It's having something that you're passionate about and enjoying. That's what will get you through an interview. Good stuff. Yeah, no, I'm just very conscious of uh, we're talking about the economic crisis in Ireland and we're just sort of thinking back to where we were 10 years ago. 
uh, when the last economic crisis and how people sort of adapted just by, uh, you know, pivoting towards technology in their careers and stuff like that, you know, so that that's sort of where it came from. People sort of like who might have different careers over the next few years or, or, or also people who are very young in their careers, let's say 20 year olds and, you know, they're learning Python in college for the first time and all that. That's where that was came, coming from. I'll just see if we have any more questions there. No, okay. I, I'm, I'm done, I think. I actually have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were talking, you were talking about, oh, first of all, amazing talk. It was, was really, really, really cool. I had have, have, have had a look uh, at uh, that Medium post, the one that you're saying that the guy said that talks about the 20% and you can say anything. I was like, mm, this seems really interesting. And I was curious actually about studying, studying doing that tutorial to see what was going to come out of it. But um, you are mentioning before um, platforms such as Revolut and, um, and you're talking about how crypto um, isn't real money because you can't go and buy bread with it. Um, Coinbase launched not that long ago a credit card. So it's a Visa credit card that you can put your, your crypto in and you can use that outside. And I put money on crypto as well. Just kill me now. Uh, but I have a few points. Don't do it. You do it. <laughs> I do. Um, I have very little Bitcoins, but I like the way Ethereum behaves. I like their technology and I like what they're doing apart from crypto. But anyway, um, yeah, so there is a way of bringing that money into the corner shop and buying bread with it. There what? is, right? But, so, so the, 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 but what's going to get you? So, so here's, here's what I don't like about it. It's just my opinion. Um, it moves wildly in a way that doesn't correlate to anything. So it's always sensational thing, crypto. Like you can drop $8,000 overnight, then regain six again the next day. That, to a bank, is a huge warning sign that there's something crooked going on. I mean, it's, it's flat out over, like, go back 60, 70 years into the books of any big bank. Any of them, JP Morgan, Sachs, any of them, they'll all tell you the same thing. That's when there's a warning sign on there. Goldman Sachs will broker Bitcoins for you. They'll charge you a fee. They're not holding them themselves. They have no interest in buying or selling into that. But they'll help you do it. They'll provide a service to you because they're serviceable people. And they're very, they're very smart people in Goldman Sachs. Um, so they'll do that. But ultimately, if you pull the plug on the server, it's the thing is worth nothing like that. It's dead. But the gold is always there. and The gold is usable in science. Now, I don't agree with the arguments Peter Schiff and crypto have. And I have on Twitter, if you find me on there, I've had to pull Peter Schiff out of arguments. Just tell him to go to bed and turn off his phone because he's had nothing. But um, they clash head to head over everything. But like... A bank wouldn't, even Brian Moynihan, our CEO, has said, you know, it's not something we'd be interested in crypto because it doesn't move in any way that you can safely really bank on. It can go too far, too fast. And and it's not that any bank lacks the technical expertise to do it. It's just there is no model to safely navigate through it. And if I threw all, if I suddenly said to you tomorrow, well, you don't have any money in your bank account because guess what? Crypto went crazy last night. But then in a month's time, after you've gone hungry and you had no money, we go, hey, dude, we've got good news for you. we got all your money back and a little bit more because crypto went good again. No one can live like that. So we can't, you have to have a steady flow of cash to do the thing. You can't do it with that. So I'm baffled still as to who's chucking big money into it. But um, the other thing is it's not possible to tell who's buying and selling on either side. Like it is a great way to launder money and we all know that. And if it's a great way to launder it, there's no point in a couple of Bitcoin guys saying, well, no one launders on it. That's just not true. People launder money in banks, even though banks are set up to catch them from doing it, but they still get away with it. And in small amounts, it still happens. They get caught, they go to jail. You know, eventually a bank will catch someone laundering money, but sometimes it can take a few months or a year to catch them out, no matter how vigilant you are, because people always find a way. There's a lot of machine learning on that topic, which is really good. But in the crypto market, People can launder like crazy. No one will stop them. No one will investigate them. No one regulates them. They're under nothing at all. It's quite and they new. all equate back. Yeah. It's quite new as quite. well. So it's, yeah. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. 
There's another question there. Um, I'll let you take it there, Louise. Okay. Uh, so it's a question from Navan Kurverma. So uh, she's asking you, so can you suggest about how much visualizations are important in finance and what specific Python, library are, Python libraries are being used other than normal ones, Matplotch, Bokeh, Plotly? Uh, the notebooks for me are one of the greatest visual tools uh, on the go in Python. They're, um, I'll give you an example. If you do a massive amount of big data number crunching and you aggregate your answer up, stuff it into a notebook, um, just rerun the notebook off that, and you're able to present all the important visuals and metrics and that, it's a living piece of documentation. Um, and it depends on the actual thing you're trying to show. I mean, if it's a, it's a simple pie chart of you know, where your, your market base is, or if it's a graph showing a spike or a drop or a predicted thing, it, depending on what you want to do, um, it doesn't really matter. In our place, we're limited in the number of libraries we can bring in. We, we have a, a pip repository and a conda repository that it takes a while to vet you know, public libraries and get them in. We have to make sure they're secure. So Matplot is one I use a lot of uh, in a Jupyter notebook. But the, broader, the, the bigger question I think is, are visuals important? Absolutely. If the data science is important to find out what the truth is, the final bit of presentation, absolutely critical because you are more than likely going to present important detail to someone who, has, who will not look at it. Like you, you can't expect a senior trading manager to look at an Excel table with 100,000 rows in it and decipher from that in five minutes what he's supposed to do for the rest of the day. You'll bring it in in, in graph form with the problem perfectly highlighted, color coded, not being rude, like you know, like Fisher Price, <laughs> that a child could understand. But that, that's what you want because in a split second he will understand it and he'll make a decision and he'll want the next graph up and that speeds up the whole day. So the ability to present and to sift through the numbers and get the important stuff out and be accurate, hugely, not, in, not just in banks, anywhere in the world it's a skill that's been lacking for a long while and even some of the some of the data presentations you do see you can see in the presentation someone's already gone off track down a bit of a rabbit hole and they throw a big thing up on the screen and it's hard to see what's actually going on in it so um that's a good skill to practice staying on track but yeah graphics important oh then uh, we have another question uh, from Jason. So um, uh, aside from financial gain with Bitcoin, how do you see Python can be used with distributed ledger, which means proof of work, as you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Now that, that's, I, that's the uh, huge important use case for that. Um, I don't, for the ledger work, banks may want to ledger everything, definitely, because it can't be tampered with. At some point, they want to extract it and have it in a in a straight up uh, relational database, just to be able to aggregate and do work with, or maybe some big data thing. But you have to be able to do those functions, means deviations, groups, all that kind of stuff. So I know that blockchain isn't strictly suited to that off the bat, and there is some work around that to make it a little easier. But but movements of like movements of commodities, um, for futures contracts, moving oil around. It's a big thing you have to do and double check it's in one place and then in the other. Uh, movement of corns or grains or cereals or fruit, orange juice, milk, whatever it is, dairy, you name it. Anything we move around the world, timber that we want to sell. Blockchain ledgering for logistics is like massively important for that. And I, I do see there's easy bindings for Python to work with that. Um, I think what companies need to know is how is it easy and effective to set up a blockchain store of their own just to, to ledger their work. And then how it's easy to make it open where it needs to be open for other people to be able to leverage what's going on in there. But um, I mean, if enough of the important movement of goods in the world and, and people and effort was properly ledgered and blockchain, then you could do a decent enough pull between them. Like I said, in the trading problem, you would not be relying on gut feeling and instinct and people reacting to things on Twitter to drive the stock market. It would be there in black and white, observable by everyone, agreeable by everyone. There would be no argument about the price. Arbitrage would be much less than it is today. So I think anybody who has a skill with blockchain can get it running quickly and is good with Python. 
and can and it can explain and apply good use cases for blockchain on an interview i mean that or even a presentation at some conference where someone might see it that's gold going forward just being able to use the tool properly you know yourself when a tool comes out it'll do everything it'll cure corona it'll bring us to mars it'll do all these things it won't it'll only do the job it's supposed to do it's just a type of hammer but being able to explain why it's a good hammer and where exactly to hammer it blockchain might be missing that a little bit at the moment and if anyone is any good at that fair play to you cool well thank you i think that's the end of our questions Brilliant. I'll go back to playing star trek <laughs> i just uh, finish off with one little comment it's not a really question it's just a, a sort of accompany your answer People who are new to Python and they may be able to sort of check out a couple of the things you mentioned like Jupyter Notebooks uh, and some of those visualization libraries and things like NumPy and Pandas. Now I'm giving it a plug here. There's a thing called notebooks.azure.com that you can set it up and just sort of get practicing with them. You know, this is really aimed at beginners if you get me. Notebooks.azure.com. Um, that's all. So it, it's not. I don't think it's the most recent version of Python. I think there's some limitations, but really, this is sort of aimed towards people who are getting started. If you get me, definitely, yeah, definitely. Especially for a Pi Data talk, if we're all about data, get the notebooks, stuff your data in, do cool things with them, share them with each other. Good yeah, there, totally. Good call, Kevin. Yeah, just to get started is the hard thing. Actually, finding out how to start and easy ways to get started. Okay, I think I'll, I'll hand over to Laïs to bid us all farewell. Thanks, Laïs. Thanks, Niall. I'll, leave you, I'll sign off here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Arjuman, uh, for the great talk on Twitter. Thank you, Niall. Um, well, and thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you to all the attendees. Thank you uh, for being part of this. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, thank you for everyone that was watching us live on Twitch as well and YouTube. And we are back here next Monday. Uh, thank you very much and well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye.